an oral argument on slave reparations from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago. So, Mr. Afrin? Mr. Wareham, you want to go first? That's fine. Yes, and before I begin, um, I have a preliminary comment. My co-counsel, we are, have noticed, we're making a motion to recuse the panel. We've noticed that there was a panel with the sole African-American judge on there for all the cases this morning. And now with this case, uh, she's no longer here. My co-counsel, Mr. Afrin, had a very detailed discussion with the uh, clerk's office on the basis of why that was. He was unable to get any information. We're concerned, given the nature of uh, the, the issue we've brought here, given who our clients are, that there should at least be some explanation. In lieu of that, Thanks we're much. asking that the panel recuse itself. Well, you, well, you can file a motion if you'd like. Um, I'll give you 10 days to file any, you know, motion for recusal if you want to. Uh, okay? Okay. So, proceed. Uh, Mr. Afrin will be, I will be addressing the issue of the statute of limitations. Uh, Mr. Afrin will be addressing the issue of standing. Ms. Ratliff will be addressing the issue of the California consumer fraud complaint. Each of us will be doing, using five minutes and we're reserving five minutes for rebuttal. We are here seeking some measure of redress for the victims of a crime against humanity, the transatlantic slave trade and slavery in the United States. We have brought this suit on numerous grounds. Uh, Judge Norgal at the district court incorrectly found that the plaintiff's demands, all of them were barred by the statute of limitations. We believe that equity states that every wrong demands a remedy, and that this is a case that demands the application of an equitable analysis, and in particular the ap application of equitable tolling, which requires that, which permits a plaintiff to sue after the statute of limitations has expired, if through no fault or a lack of diligence on his part, he was unable to sue before even though the defendant took no active steps to prevent him from suing. And in this case, we believe not only did the plaintiffs take, exercise due diligence, but that the defendants took active steps to prevent, to at least conceal their um, involvement in this crime against humanity. It is not an issue of whether plaintiffs are the ancestors of the plaintiffs knew that they had been injured. There's no way that they could not have known that they had been injured in terms of being victims of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. They knew the whip. They knew chains. They knew the humiliation of having their children sold, their wives raped, their men bred as studs of enforced literacy, and they knew the misery of working from can see to can see without being paid for it. But they did not know those who were responsible for their condition. They did not know about banks and insurance companies in far-off northern states whose investments in them made the institution of slavery possible. And even if they had known, there were no courts available for them to seek redress. Contrary to Judge Norgal's version of history that he put out in his order, the end of chattel slavery, the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution did not produce a land of milk and honey for formerly enslaved Africans. Judge Norgal's version of history upon which he predicates his decision to, to uh, deny us equitable tolling is based, ignores the issue of lynchings, ignores the, 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 the reality of sharecropping, of Jim Crow, of the Ku Klux Klan, which reigned supreme for almost 100 years uh, following the end of chattel slavery. I understand how that supports equitable tolling because <clears throat> because um, uh, these <clears throat> wrong the slave trade and, and exploitation by business and so on. <clears throat> this has been known for a long time, right? This is not something that was suddenly discovered three years ago. What was discovered was the, the particularity of who the defendants were. And and that is why equitable that is why equitable tolling is proper in, in this in this case. But if you think you've been wronged 
and you don't know who the tortfeasor is, but you know there's been some wrong, you've been injured by something, then you have to investigate. And if a really protracted investigation is required, then the equitable tolling period could be stretched a long time. But it shouldn't take, you know, 100 years to investigate these, or 150 years. Well, that's not really, 100 years to investigate these, the conduct, you know, of Aetna and Lehman Brothers and the like. Well, first of all, there has been investigations, and it was only in the last four or five years that that information came out. And I'm getting into my time, but the investigations that went on only within the last few years reveal that. These defendants never in their annual reports, never in their corporate statements, never in anything that recounts their history of their companies, they conveniently ignored that fact. So there was no way for people to know that. That sounds like the argument that until a potential person pleads guilty to violating some rights, the time to sue doesn't even begin. Well, what it speaks to is that until the plaintiff has access of information of who committed the injury against them, they have no one to bring into court. It would be thrown out because they have not demonstrated that. I would like to reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal and turn it over to Mr. Afrin. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ware. Mr. Afrin? Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, in terms of the questions the Court posed to my co-counsel, they're actually very good questions because they go directly to the factual heart of the case. None of those questions can be answered without a factual inquiry. None was had. This was a motion to dismiss, not converted to a summary judgment motion, and no factual inquiry was had nor any opportunity to address these questions, which are pregnant with factual contention. So the procedural problem here is that even if the Court could ultimately be right in that there's no basis for equitable tolling, we've had no factual inquiry to determine that. Now, if the Court would determine after a hearing, and our reply brief addresses in detail, that in cases of this nature where there's a substantive question as to equitable tolling, the matter must be set for a hearing. Now, if the Court were to hold such a hearing and determine 1960 or 1925 or 1995 was the last date for tolling, then that would resolve the matter. But we've had no such hearing, and we have factual issues that show a basis for tolling. So that would resolve all their issues, including standing, because quite clearly, if I may just address this one point, if the matter is tolled until 2002, then the only parties who can bring the action are those living in 2002. So standing inevitably follows a factual finding on tolling. But on the standing problem, my skepticism about your case is I don't see how the methods of litigation are adequate to actually draw a causal connection between events of these businesses, say, like I think you have 1853 that Aetna was insuring slaves. I don't know how that could be connected to an injury to a modern person. Your Honor, we're not so far from that era. The last slave died in 1979. In 1971, Sylvester McGee died, also a slave. Charlie Smith died in 79. Throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, many slaves were living. But was he insured by Aetna? Your Honor, let's look at it from the disparity of position. We have slaves held in peonage, illiterate by law, required to remain illiterate in virtually every jurisdiction where slavery existed. We have J.P. Morgan, Chase, and other entities here in exclusive possession of their information. As we see in construction sites, banks advertise financing provided by Bank of America, but they don't go to the plantation to do that. That's different. No, which is very concrete. Even if you had a document showing that so you could identify that one of your clients was the descendant of a slave who had been insured by Aetna, how would you go about showing that that insurance policy had somehow caused a harm to a modern person? 
Because the owner would not buy a slave and invest the money in buying the slave if someone wasn't willing to insure his investment. In the same way we insure our investments today. Without insurance, there would have been no slavery? Without insurance, without loans upon slaves, without the vast financial apparatus that was used to support this institution. There was extensive slavery in Greece without insurance markets. I really hope Your Honor is not going to evaluate torts against American citizens by other American citizens by ancient Greece. You just made a factual claim that without insurance, there can be no slavery. And I was observing that that appears not to be the case for most of the time in most places in the world. Your Honor, I don't... So why would you think it to be true in the American South in the 19th century? Your Honor, the nature of American slavery was of a highly economically oriented business. Specie, hard currency, was rarely available in the American South. Credit was used to purchase slaves. Even if that were true, you know, no insurance industry, no slavery, you'd still have a great deal of difficulty connecting... I mean, in 1853, what law would Aetna have been violating by insuring slaves? Your Honor, in every northern state where these financial companies were headquartered, and I would not say it's limited to insurance. The principal claim here is banking companies that loan money to buy slaves. In every northern state, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Pennsylvania, slavery was illegal, as was taking an interest in slaves. So, and the defense never objected to this contention in any substantive way. And Judge Norgal addressed in his opinion the fact that in many northern states, slavery was illegal. So we have an issue of an apparently illegal activity in the states these banks were headquartered in. Now, Dean Prosser... Now, how would you show that if Aetna was violating the law in insuring slaves, how would you show that that had caused some tangible injury to someone living today? Your Honor, the issue... I don't know what the white light means. My apologies, Your Honor. I don't know how much time I have left. Don't worry about it. Thank you, Your Honor. The injury is several fold. One, any deprivation of wages through slavery obviously prevents the slave from acquiring assets. Even if it's de minimis, it's still an injury to the descendant. If an ancestor of a living person had had a higher income because he or she was not a slave but employed in some capacity, how would you ever show that because that person had had or would have had a higher income, well, a positive income rather than a zero income, this would have been reflected in some change in the wealth of a current person? Your Honor, most of us who are parents expect to pass our wealth on to our children, whether that wealth is large or small. People who were not slaves in the 1850s were not people who accumulated estates. That's not true at all, Your Honor. There were many wealthy African Americans who were free. And I would point out, Your Honor... Well, I know, but of course there's a... But are you prepared to show that the ancestor of the plaintiffs and the class members were in fact people who would have accumulated substantial estates which would not have been dissipated over the last 150 years? I am prepared to show that... A lot of people living today whose parents were wealthy in the 19th century and who have nothing. Your Honor, I am prepared to show that slaves who would have been free would have acquired significant assets. There are many examples of African Americans who did. There are millions of Americans today who have inherited wealth from the homesteading era which slaves were kept out of. I have a friend, for example, whose family owned mills prior to the Civil War, whose home and kids' tuition was paid by the proceeds of the sale of those mills in the 1890s. And I will be prepared to say in great detail that transgenerational wealth would have been transmitted to these individuals today. In addition, we are not far removed. Two of our plaintiffs are the children of pre-1865 slaves who live today. They have an undoubted interest in asserting the rights denied to their parents' estates. The nondisclosure until beginning in 2000 prevented the living freed slaves from bringing these actions. Now, if we had a chemical maker who knew he was marketing a dangerous chemical, knew it was causing injury to two to three generations of workers, then discloses and makes his mea culpa only after the last of the workers are dead, would we immunize that company from suits by the descendant? We would not. We need to begin to realize this is a great massive tort created by these banks that finance the slavery of the ancestors and the parent of my clients. 
This is not ancient history. This is living history. And had these banks made their disclosures in the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, there would have been hundreds and at times thousands of living plaintiffs who were slaves who could have brought this action. Do we reward these defendants for their nondisclosure? But, but are, you, are you saying that, that if these defendants had not violated any laws in the 1850s or so, there wouldn't, wouldn't have been slavery? Slavery was materially advanced by the capital forwarded by those who loaned money to the master to buy slaves. Would there have been slavery? Of course. But was it enabled? Because now you're saying, well, maybe there would have been less slavery. I, I will answer that question. If We can't say there would have been no slavery. I would never suggest that. But obviously, if a joint tortfeasor materially contributes to the maintenance of an institution, he bears a substantive degree of liability. We're asking to measure his liability by the profits he made from those actions. That's an inherently reasonable fit. How do you possibly determine what, what profits Aetna made from insuring slaves? Well, it's not only Aetna, Your Honor. I think that's not the strongest area to focus upon. The banks, for example, that bought slaves and financed them, J.P. Morgan Chase, has disclosed in 2005 that it had liens on 13,000 slaves and owned 1,200 outright. We can calculate almost precisely with a, to eliminate virtually any reasonable degree of speculation the profits earned from those slaves and what the present value would be today. The average sale price of an adult slave was $2,500. The 1,200 slaves owned outright by J.P. Morgan Chase would have had a present value today of a minimum of $850 million based on the actual market value, I hate to use that phrase, of $1.7 million in 1865. And we can calculate the profits made by the loans to slaves by the percent of capital advanced by the prevailing interest that's, rates in those that's days. That's not correct, because obviously if Morgan, well, J.P. Morgan, well, I, well, yeah, I don't think he was in business in the 1850s. Chase anyway, was, Your Honor. Pardon? Well, the, the, well whatever, respect, his yes. predecessor, whatever. whatever. Um, if this person, this firm, had not... Um, finance slaves, they would have financed something else. Now, maybe it would have been less profitable, but how could you possibly compute how much less profitable it would have been to finance uh, sharecroppers? I understand Your Honor's economic focus, but I would suggest that this is very much an issue of fact. And secondly, we don't reward a torch yes, fees simply know, because he could have invested in honest see, work. The problem, the problem with calling it an issue of fact, I mean, the court, courts have of finite intellectual uh, resources, and it would I would guess it would be a really formidable historical inquiry to try to figure out um, what uh, the Morgan predecessors' economic uh, commercial alternatives would have been uh, if they had decided not to finance slaves. Your Honor, I can't believe that the legal position would be determined by the fact that the wrongdoer who violates the criminal statutes of his own state, causing a tort on innocent people, is free from liability simply because he could have invested in honest work. The fact that he chose to divert his capital to a criminal act, causing untold injury to people, creates his liability. It does not matter what he might have made and what no, differential would have existed no, in honest labor. No, because if Morgan hadn't financed slaves, someone else who's not a defendant would, would have, right? I mean, what, Morgan is the one that did it. It doesn't matter that some other bank well, chose not to. It doesn't matter in the sense that if the only effect, if, if the only significance of Morgan's conduct is that some other company financed sharecroppers and Morgan financed slaves, then if you remove, if Morgan had made a different decision, there would have been no consequences for your clients. It's just some other company would have done the slave financing. Your Honor, that's, that's like suggesting that if one man robbed a bank, he need not pay back what he stole because someone else would have done it anyway. That no, makes no sense at no, all. No, that's not true because... Uh, it because seems a direct that, import of Your Honor's analysis. That, quite, that supply of bank robbers, but what is true is I that... I think the FBI has a grand total on its banks. If there are commercial opportunities, we expect firms to uh, uh, exploit them. Your Honor, if, the, if the bank chose to advance its commercial opportunity through crime and tort, it needs to be redressed. It does not matter that it might, in a more fit moment of conscience, chosen to do otherwise. If you calculate the amount with some reasonable objectivity, then it just 
is beyond the judicial power. Well, we don't know that, do we? Because we had... That's the standing. Your Honor, we can't determine that unless we have a hearing at the district court to see what standards can be used. In the asbestos cases, in the tobacco cases, hearings were held to determine the manageability. They weren't thrown out ever on a motion to dismiss without conversion. It's the issue of manageability. It's the issue of standing. The issue of standing... No, Your Honor is asking how we would calculate damages. That strikes me as an issue of manageability. How you would show there had been an injury. We can show... Our clients are entitled to project what their likely inheritance could have been, but they're asking for less than that. They're asking simply to disgorge the lost profits. In addition, I would point out that if the matter is to be equitably told, because of the nondisclosure and that gross disparity of information monopolized by the banks, then the present generation stand in the shoes necessarily of their ancestors. And so there's no need to prove direct injury to that present generation because equitable tolling would mandate that someone be permitted to go forward because the delay by the defendants prejudiced the right of the original victims to move ahead with the action. So if we accept equitable tolling, we've had no hearing to determine whether it ought to be. Your Honor's questions are fact pregnant. We need a hearing to discuss that. If we accept that equitable tolling could have occurred, then we know the standing issue is largely resolved because those in life today are standing in the shoes of those who were denied the opportunity to proceed earlier. And at every point in the 20th century, since the inception of numerous disclosure requirements, the banks ought to have made disclosure of these actions, or at least it can be argued quite credibly. And if they had done so, the living slaves would have had the information then in their lives to bring these actions. If equitable tolling is to be held, then it follows inevitably that those in life today must bring the action or equitable tolling would have no purpose. So we need a hearing to determine a basis for equitable tolling. In the Alexander case, that's precisely what happened. The court said 1982 is the cutoff for tolling. Well, they had a hearing to determine that. All of these questions the court has put to us are the questions we've reviewed, but they're all fact pregnant. They're all fact laden. To discuss this on a motion to dismiss is simply improper procedurally. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wareham. Mr. Ratliff? Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, we stand on our brief and just want to point out some new events that have occurred. With respect to the California case, the primary issue is that the lower court dismissed the case without even discussing the issues in the California case. And we had issues. We brought our case based on some California statutes. This is the hurdle case. Right. And two of those statutes had to deal with standing and statute of limitations. And one of those cases, I put it out in the footnote in our brief, footnote eight, was that since we filed our lawsuit September 2002, in November 2004, California voters voted for Proposition 64 that amended the California Business and Professions Code sections 17, 200, 203, 204, on which we were basing our standing. And basically that statute said that an individual could basically act as a private attorney general and bring a lawsuit against the corporation or business for disgorgement of profits that were obtained unfairly or illegally without having to show direct injury. Well, the law has changed. And I'd like an opportunity to submit a brief on the cases because we haven't had an opportunity to do this. One of the cases, Californians for Disability Rights v. Mervyn's, there was a motion for rehearing denied August 30th. So one thing I also noticed in reading those cases was that they did not deal with the conflict between retroactivity of Proposition 64 and specific provisions in the California Constitution that provides that a referendum becomes effective the day after the election. So that wasn't dealt with, and that's a constitutional issue. So we'd like an opportunity to brief that. In the event that the court does not remand this case to the state court, which I think should be done, and that is our request, then we would like to amend our complaint so that we can allege that the plaintiff has standing independent of the statute 17-203-204. The other thing that I'd like to really emphasize is that 
I see us playing these legal gymnastics here. And what we'd like for the court to do is to use your power, use your influence to address this very serious issue that has never been dealt with. Here we are, you know, first we are told slavery was legal. Now here we are being told that um, the types of things that we're trying to do have been barred, so it's illegal. We don't make these laws. And we know that what has happened to us has affected us not only economically, but it has affected us psychologically, emotionally. We have not even been prepared to bring these lawsuits. We're just getting to the point where we could even do this. And in the Garamendi case, I don't know if I cited it in this brief, but it, but it certainly was cited in the lower court. President Clinton used his power as President of the United States in the, in the year 2000 to negotiate a settlement in the Jewish slave laborer cases. And as a result of his coming in there and doing this treaty with Gerard Schroeder, they uh, ended up with a human humanitarian fund that was uh, funded to the tune of about $6.2 billion. They had over 6,000 corporations in Europe participating. The United States pledged $29 million to the fund. And many of the corporations that participated were not even involved in the Holocaust or came into existence in the 1950s after World War II. And what we need here is a spirit of motivation. And this court, and I've been led to believe that this court has the power to have a settlement conference. You can bring in CEOs of these corporations and you can use your influence to motivate not just these people, but you can bring in uh, other companies, you can bring in experts, and you can be the beginning. It only takes one or two people who can decide to do what has not been done. There has not, not been any reconstruction for freed slaves uh, uh, for a sustained amount of time since 1865. And it begins with you. Why do we get all this education if we're not going to use our influence? And this, I think, is the most important case ever. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Radcliffe. So you... No, no, no. Hey. You're not permitted to applaud in, in a courtroom. That's very improper behavior, and you all be expelled if you keep on doing that. You understand? We have our own rules. So, Ms. Radler, you can have 10 days to submit the supplemental materials you wanted to on, uh, okay, on those you. cases. Thank you. Um, Mr. Meyer? Mr. Mayor? Oh, I had, I had a fourth counsel list. Is there another? That was the oh, okay. Th thank you. Then, then I'm sorry. Then we'll hear from Mr. Uh, Maddens. May it please the court, Alan Maddens, for the defendants. I'd like to address the issues of standing and the statute of limitations, both of which uh, the defendants posit were appropriate bases, necessary bases for dismissal of these cases. With respect to the standing doctrine, standing is premised at bottom on the notion of separation of powers, which I think is an important concept based on the arguments that we've just been hearing. The importance to society, the importance politically of an issue does not excuse standing requirements, which are quite clear. To the contrary, if anything, the political and societal importance of issues dealing with slavery only fit right into the reasons why there is no standing, as well as some of the issues that Mr. Pell will be discussing next. The plaintiffs had a burden to show that there was standing. The plaintiffs had a burden to show that there was a concrete, non-speculative injury. The plaintiffs had the burden to show that that distinct and palpable injury was fairly traceable to the actions of these defendants, their injury, these defendants. And the plaintiffs had the burden to show that the injury traceable to these defendants could be properly redressed by the exercise of the judicial power. The injury here is clearly derivative. It's described as such in the plaintiff's complaint. It is plainly conjectural and hypothetical for many of the reasons that Judge Posner was already describing. The plaintiffs, uh, one of the principal ways in which the plaintiffs try to get past the concrete injury requirement 
is to show that they are standing in the shoes of their ancestors. That involves necessary speculation that had their ancestors been paid for their labor, that those monies would have, in fact, not been spent, but rather would have been passed on and would have been passed on to these particular plaintiffs who allege in a couple of cases that they are seeking or have sought or might seek to actually be the personal representative or executor of someone's estate, but nobody actually alleges that they are, nor is it plausible to think that somebody at this late date could obtain that status. Now, even if the plaintiffs could demonstrate that it was likely that they would have inherited, even that is not sufficient because the likelihood or expectation of inheriting from someone is the kind of injury that's been called a bare expectancy of no legal significance in cases that we cite. Then the plaintiffs argue that as consumers they have suffered some kind of cognizable injury, but they don't and can't allege that the defendants had any obligation to provide the information that they're now saying was not provided. And the consumer protection laws that have been asserted here, they have nothing to do with complaining about a company's historical practices. They have to do with the sales of products and services and people who are injured because of that. If the plaintiffs choose not to deal with these defendants, that's their right. With respect to the fairly traceable element of standing, the plaintiffs needed to allege, need to be prepared to show that their injury is the result directly of something that these defendants did, not the result of actions by others either instead of or in addition. But most important, there's no linkage alleged in these complaints between anything that these defendants purportedly did and any harm that was suffered specifically by these plaintiffs or even their ancestors. Prior slavery reparations cases have also foundered on this element of the standing analysis. There are also, in addition to these constitutionally imposed standing elements that I've been discussing, certain prudential standing considerations as well that this court and all federal courts. I'm curious about this, is the status of heirs. We don't usually think of heirs as victims, right? That's correct, Your Honor. Heirs are people who may be able to sue as the representative. I mean, sometimes wrongful death, some states the heirs lose support, but generally the victims would be the people who were slaves, right? Those would certainly be the persons with the injuries. The heirs, Your Honor, in most states, I think all states, do not have the right to sue as such. In Illinois, for example, the McGill case that's cited says that you have to be the executor or an administrator. You have to be appointed in order to represent an estate. In a wrongful death context, what you're talking about is individuals who claim that they have suffered a loss of support. They have their own injury. So that's not relevant here. Now, one of the prudential standing issues, of course, is whether the plaintiffs are asserting a generalized grievance that's more suitable to the representative branches. Mr. Pell will discuss that in a couple of minutes on political question. What about the plaintiffs that were enslaved in the 20th century? Now, that's a lot more recent, right? There are two plaintiffs, the Wall plaintiffs and I believe Ms. Clark, who alleged that they were enslaved in plantations in Louisiana, I believe, in the case of Ms. Clark. There is simply no allegation that these defendants had anything at all to do with that enslavement or with anything else dealing with it. The allegation as to Mr. Wall is that the defendants did business in some of the same states in which goods that Mr. Wall's labor helped to produce were shipped. That is not an injury that's fairly traceable to these defendants for standing purposes, and that's their best case. 
With respect to the statute of limitations, I'm not sure if the white light is telling me that I'm eating into Mr. Pell's time yet. No, go ahead. On statute of limitations, courts have routinely dismissed reparations cases on limitations grounds. That includes the Alexander case dealing with the city of Tulsa race riots in the 1920s. It includes the more recent Holocaust reparations cases. Those cases, to the extent that they've generated payments to Holocaust victims, that has occurred through the political process, as Ms. Ratliff explained, with respect to President Clinton, and with respect to slavery, which is obviously the most distant of the reparations scenarios. There have been cases which go back to the mid-1990s, which dismissed slavery reparations cases on, among other things, limitations grounds. And since the maximum statute of limitations here was six years, and it was more than six years between the times that those slavery reparations cases were dismissed and the time that these cases were filed, it's a very simple analysis. The equitable tolling argument in the Seventh Circuit, and I think, Your Honor, Judge Posner wrote the Singletary case, for example, one has to plead and then be able to demonstrate equitable tolling facts. There are 366 paragraphs in the second amended and consolidated complaint after Judge Norgal had given the plaintiffs an opportunity in dismissing their first amended to amend and to assert equitable tolling and to otherwise salvage their claims. And there's not one paragraph of those 366 that says anything about what kind of reasonable diligence these plaintiffs and their ancestors used from the 1860s forward to know that these plaintiffs, I'm sorry, that these defendant companies were involved in the slave-based economy. Just one point on what Ms. Ratliff said. I know it hasn't been cited, but since she's gone ahead and mentioned it, I thought I should explain. The Mervyn's case out of California was one that held that Proposition 64 does apply to require actual injury in order to assert a claim under the California statutes that are the basis of the hurdle claim, even where those claims predated Proposition 64. The hurdle claim, does that really belong here? Why was that consolidated with the other? Well, first of all, Your Honor, as you'll see in Judge Norgal's second opinion, he did discuss and dismiss both on limitations and failure to state a claim grounds the California statutory claim, which is also featured in the second amended complaint. Should the case have been transferred here? No, Your Honor. The case was properly removed on diversity grounds. In California? Right. It was removed from the California State Court to the California District Court and then brought here. But should it have been transferred? That is, should it have been consolidated with these other cases? Yes, Your Honor. I don't think that there's any argument that I recall, at least, that it shouldn't have been transferred. There are claims about remand. The brief says, no, that it wasn't a proper tag-along case. Well, it clearly raises the same questions, albeit California being a different state than was raised in many of the other cases. But the second amended consolidated complaint also asserts the very same claim that the hurdles claim. It's a slavery reparations claim, and we believe it was properly MDL'd. Does that amended complaint mention the California law? Yes, the hurdles didn't join in the second amended consolidated complaint. But the other plaintiffs there did reference that statute, and Judge Norgal discussed it. Okay. Before you sit down, let me follow that up a little more. Was there any objection made in the district court based on lexicon to the district court resolving these transferred cases on the merits? I'm not aware of any objection made based on lexicon. Actually, it would be our position. The Supreme Court has said that after pretrial proceedings are over, the cases have to be transferred back to their originating districts. So I don't understand why they were resolved on the merits in northern Illinois. Now, it may be that that argument has been forfeited. There's no mention of lexicon in any of the appellant's briefs. Correct. That would be our position, Your Honor. But I think that Judge Norgal, in disposing and finding that these cases were barred by standing political question and limitations and for failure to state a claim, that was the end of the game in terms of pretrial proceedings. So we don't think he needed to transfer when there was a final judgment to be entered based on 
the proceedings that he was properly engaged in. It's hard to see the entry of final judgment on a case as a form of pretrial proceeding, but since the argument isn't being made by the appellants, we needn't pursue it. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Maddins. Mr. Powell. Thank you, Your Honor. And please, the Court. I was going to address briefly the political question issues and the failure to state a claim issues, although I think what Mr. Maddins has said fairly deals with those. The district court did correctly dismiss these actions as non-justiciable. The district court did correctly recognize that the issue of slavery reparations was committed to the political branches because it was inherently... That wouldn't apply to the people who were enslaved in the 20th century, right? Oh, I think it would. Oh. I think it would for the same reasons, Your Honor. The people in the 20th century... It's one thing to say, you know, the Emancipation and so on and the 14th Amendment, the 13th Amendment and so forth brought about some fundamental change in society and so forth, but, you know, there are cases involving illegal immigrants and so on where you have people being enslaved. The courts can certainly deal with issues like that without any strain. Well, what the courts can deal with, Your Honor, is that there are already laws on the books. The courts don't have to create remedies in place of the political branches. The courts already have remedies that the political branches have created by way of civil rights legislation, by way of... If you enslave someone today... That's a crime. You know, it's false imprisonment and theft of services. It's all sorts of criminal and tortious activity, and someone can bring a case, a regular civil case. There's no political question issue there. Maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, Your Honor. The only political question would be is if you tried to assert a remedy that otherwise didn't exist in the rubric, in the panoply you just laid out. If you tried to bring a claim against someone who had not committed any of those acts, who had not falsely imprisoned, who had not taken labor themselves, if you tried to expand beyond the law... State common law, you can certainly create new remedies. You can attempt to. You can attempt to. But I would generally agree that the remedies that already are there are available. If the courts want to use those remedies to fashion new remedies, that might also work without raising a political question under Baker v. Carr. But certainly the claim for labor conferred prior... If New York State wanted to punish Brown Brothers for having financed slavery and created a civil action against, you know, companies that had financed slavery in the 19th century, and it's a diversity suit, gets removed into federal court, but the only issue is state law, why would there be any political questions? I'm not sure it would necessarily be a political question. Most of their claims are state law claims. Yes, Your Honor, and always have been, other than the 1982 claim and some initial claims under treaties. How can a state law claim be extinguished by political... I mean, maybe if it involved a Republican form of government or something. That would be a federal. Yeah, I don't understand. Other than perhaps the due process issue of retroactivity, Your Honor, I don't know that there would necessarily be a political question. But on the state law claims here, the plaintiffs are attempting to use state law claims to fashion a remedy that could, with regard to Civil War-related claims pre-1865, are trying to fashion a remedy that could only have been fashioned by the political branches, because only those branches could determine how to wage the Civil War, which was fought over state and federal law relating to slavery, how to dismantle slavery, and how to deal with slavery after the end of the war. It was up to the political branches to do that, because the political branches get to decide how war is made and how peace is restored and maintained. The political branches actually did that here. They actually decided what they wanted to do vis-a-vis conferring rights. But slavery was illegal in the North, so why would the Civil War affect what a state today wanted to do? I mean, suppose New York said, you know, these slaves were... Slavery was illegal, but we allowed these companies to violate our laws and so on, and now we think there ought to be some legal remedy. I don't see why 
their doing that would have anything to do with the political questions doctrine. It would just be a matter of state law. As I said before, Your Honor, I think the only issue there would be the issue of retroactivity, whether a state could. Well, yeah, maybe there's some kind of federal defense. But, again, that's not the political questions doctrine. Correct. That would just be a straight substantive. Due process kind of claim. That's right. I would think that's right, Your Honor. How political questions doctrine comes into this case. But I think where Judge Norgal was focusing on was the political question doctrine as it applies to claims based on the slavery period ending in 1865, which is the heart of the complaint and the heart of the damage claim, unjust enrichment tied to the pre-1865 period. But, again, if it's all a matter of state law, you know, a very sensitive issue. Federal court might decide to certify the issue to state Supreme Court. Do you really mean to create a remedy for, you know, events happening 200 years ago? But, again, I don't see what it would have to do with political questions doctrine. Well, I think, Your Honor, the political question doctrine is that the plaintiffs can point to no state law that definitively creates these remedies. And I do believe that with regard. Definitive? No. So are you now making the point that every effort by federal courts to enforce state common law is a violation of the political question doctrine? No, Your Honor. Quite the opposite. So they don't need to point to a state law. It's enough if there's state common law. Even as to state common law, these remedies do not exist under state common law. The remedy they're seeking is damages. That's a substantive issue. It's a perfectly. I think the political question issue. My suggestion is you move to some other issue. Okay, Your Honor. With the other issue that does arise under the political question doctrine is the issue of manageable standards. And maybe the analysis is the same, and I don't need to address it. By some other issue, I meant an issue other than the political question doctrine. That's an issue of manageability of a class action, isn't it, rather than political questions? Yes. That's exactly right. And there are no standards for managing an action of this type because there is no unifying characteristic to the proposed class, and there cannot be. Not every African American in the United States was enslaved during the slavery period. Not every African American today is descended from someone who was. And the list goes on. And the absence of those unifying characteristics would have made it impossible to fashion a standard under Rule 23 to deal with this issue. And so certainly there, there was a problem under the political question doctrine, and I think Judge Norgal recognized it, although I don't believe he cited Rule 23 in his decision. With regard to the failure to state a claim, I just want to highlight what Mr. Madden said, which was the absence of any relationship or direct connection between any plaintiff and any defendant and the fact that the claims here are for values of unspecified labor, damage for unspecified torts, and return of unspecified property. Again, there's no – they've all had three times to plead their complaints. They all had three shots at pleading something with a reasonable certainty as to damages, and they never could do that. These are inherently speculative claims, and even under the consumer protection statutes, where injury in fact is required, there can be no remedy. I thank the Court for its time. Thank you, Mr. Powell. So who is going to rebut from the plaintiff? Mr. Wareham? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Afrin. Yeah, that's fine. Whoever you want, fine. So time expired, but we'll give you a couple of minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll try to be brief. With regard to the lexicon question, although we don't cite lexicon directly, we make it absolutely clear that Judge Norgal's duty was to conduct discovery or at least some evidentiary hearing to address these types of questions, and our brief is replete with references to the failure in that duty. So we don't cite lexicon directly. I'll agree with that, but we make it clear his duty was to conduct discovery. But why does he have to determine standing? Because if he has no – if there's no standing, he can't do discovery, right? Without question, but I think these issues are fact-intensive, and in cases of this nature, there should be a hearing to allow us on summary judgment or in a similar proceeding to address those facts we have. There were no affidavits submitted. Yes, but he would have to make a threshold determination whether there was standing, wouldn't he? 
I think many of those determinations are made only after a preliminary hearing. For example, equitable tolling usually does require... Maybe he could postpone it, but if he thought that there was no standing and that no factual inquiry into standing would change his judgment, then he would be authorized to dismiss the case. I think maybe technically it should go back to the original courts, but if there's clearly no issue that the court sees, then perhaps as a management matter it could be done in the multi-district court. But our contention is that these are fact-intensive and there needs to be a remand for that hearing. Most cases of this nature have that type of preliminary approach. Judge Norgal has made numerous inferences of fact that really should have been derived only after we had the opportunity on an evidentiary process, such as on summary judgment, to address that. These issues are too important to be disposed of following no displeading, and they're too fact-intensive, I think, as Your Honor's questions and as our colloquy demonstrates. So our essential request for relief is simply a remand for those preliminary questions to be decided in a fact hearing, summary judgment or something analogous. And that's really the essence of the appeal process we're seeking. Now, we hope we've persuaded the court of the need for that. In the event that we have not, and I dearly hope that is not true, in the event that we have not, there is one final question. I don't think the complaint should be dismissed with prejudice because really there is a question of Article III jurisdiction raised through standing, and there may be state court actions that can derive from the same sets of facts. Well, if there's no standing, dismissal is without prejudice. There should be, but the case was dismissed with prejudice, and we believe that was inappropriate no matter what other relief this court could grant. But I say that only in the extreme alternative. I do not wish the court to think in any manner. I understand. Thank you, Your Honor. I would note there are specific factual admissions. J.P. Morgan, though it came after the briefing in this case, specifically acknowledged the ownership of 1,200 slaves and 13,000 lien interests in slaves, as have Bank of America, Fleet, and we know about Aetna's insurance policies. So there have been express admissions, and even if we could only project damages, and I believe we can do that through expert testimony very reliably, as to those admissions, that is still a highly substantial case. It is not de minimis. And even the single projection as to the 1,200 slaves and their ownership value comes to $850 million. Well, would you like to submit the information about those people? To whom, Your Honor? You said it was after the briefing. You want to? I think we would like to submit those admissions, yes, to this court. That's fine. Again, within the 10 days, is that feasible? That should work, Your Honor, yes. There are some religious holidays intervening, but I hope I can work around that. Well, 14 days. That would be helpful. Thank you, Your Honor. The final point, the question of standards, manageability, is really a duty upon the court. The court needs to inquire into whether, the district court, I mean, needs to inquire into whether there can be standards to manage the case. Many massive cases have actually been managed quite successfully, although the basis of law in the Indian treaty cases is, of course, different than these cases. The management is not difficult. How would you deal with the problem that, of course, not all black Americans are descended from slaves, so they couldn't be a part of a class, could they? No, and they're not sought to be. How would that be determined, though? Do people have records? Yes, actually, Your Honor, one of the surprises I've had is the degree of great knowledge that people have of their own genealogy. My client, Deidre Farmer-Pellman, has a very specific knowledge of her family tree, going right back to pre-1865 slavery. In my own family, often our records are lost, but I've been impressed with the intense knowledge that African Americans retain of their own ancestry, charging right back to the slave era. And we're prepared to show that that is not only not insurmountable, but very easily manageable, and we don't believe there's a difficulty there. I think our political question argument was addressed in great detail, and I would not go into it, so I'll yield the rest of my time to my colleague, if I may. I don't have any time, but if I may, ask my colleague to come up. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Averin. Mr. Wareham, do you have anything further? I'll give you a minute. Just very briefly, Your Honor. My colleagues on the other side spoke of the Tulsa case when he was addressing the question of statute of limitations, and I think the reference to the Tulsa case reinforces the request that my counsel, co-counsel, have made that Judge Norgal made a decision without the benefit of a hearing on equitable tolling. In the Tulsa case, there was that hearing on equitable tolling. 
the court found that the statute of limitations had been told at least for 60 to 70 years. It fell short of when they actually filed, but they found that the circumstances were there. We never had that opportunity at the district court level. And I think that for Judge Norgal to reach a decision of that sort, we have to at least be allowed to do that. Finally, there was a reference to the Holocaust case. But the Holocaust case was settled, certainly with the involvement of the U.S. government. But while the judge was considering a motion to dismiss, it was settled while the litigation was going on. So it didn't preclude, one did not preclude the other. And so finally, I would just say that if the court, that we hope that the court would remand, give us leave to amend a complaint, again, if necessary, with instructions to Judge Norgal, as we just raised around the question of not, if he decides to dismiss again, to do so without prejudice. And that, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all counsel for their, for you, Ms. Radcliffe. Did you have something further? Okay. There was a question asked about whether the California Supreme Court. You have to come up to the, yeah. There was a question asked about whether the California Supreme Court would consider certifying this question to the California Supreme Court. And I would say that the answer to that question is yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank